how often do you feel tempted? And as I ask that, you may be thinking, oh no, we're going to be talking about temptation and you may immediately be tempted just to tune me out. And what do I say to that? Go ahead. If you don't want to look at how you're tempted and why you're tempted, if you don't want to look at how your giving in to temptation sabotages your life, damages your relationships, separates you from God, that's your choice. You don't really need my permission, but I give you permission anyway to check out right now if you don't want to even consider how embracing temptation eventually brings hurt to you and others. So instead, do something else right now that's positive, like take a nap. At least you'll get some rest that you probably need. If you don't want to get real with yourself and with God so that you may develop a more meaningful and contented and joyful life, you might as well do something that's a value, like go get some exercise, which you may also need. But if you're ready to begin living in a way that will lead to greater health and happiness in your life, hang in there with me. The Barner group did a survey of what were the top self-reported temptations in America. Here are five of the greatest temptations that people admitted to. 60% of Americans admit that they often struggle with a noticeable and debilitating temptation to give into anxiety or worry. Interesting, it was found that the younger you are, the more probable it is that you struggle with anxiety and apprehension. 60% of Americans admit that they often struggle with the temptation to give into procrastination. They struggle to do what needs to be done in a timely manner. And interestingly, again, it was found that the younger you are, the more probable it is you struggle with procrastination. 55% of Americans admit that they often struggle with the temptation of eating too much. If you type the word obesity into Google, over 274 million results are found in less than one second, which seems to indicate how great the temptation toward overeating is. 44% of Americans admit that they often struggle with the temptation of overusing electronics and social media in unhealthy ways. And again, the survey found this was more of a temptation for younger people who were almost twice as likely as their elders to become addicted to online activities, which is concerning because huge numbers of their parents and grandparents struggle with the temptation of overusing electronics and social media in unhealthy ways, which results in negative consequences in their lives because they cannot tear themselves away from their phones or laptops. 41% of Americans admit that they often or sometimes struggle with the temptation of laziness by not working as hard as reasonably expected in their occupations. The temptation to laziness was found to be equally experienced by people of all ages in slacking off and doing what feels good to them, regardless of how it may affect others. So, how often would you say you're tempted by any of these? Anxiety, worry, procrastination, eating too much, overusing electronics, social media, laziness. Now, I did a survey through our Journey Church online Facebook group asking people, what do you think are some of the temptations the people you know struggle with the most? People who responded to my survey identified some of the same temptations found in the Barna survey, like overeating, and overuse of social media. And some of the additional temptations they identified were overspending, drugs, and gambling. 
are those things you're tempted by. In the Barna survey, people were asked why they struggled with the temptations they identified. Some of the most frequent answers were to escape or get away from real life, to feel less pain or loneliness for personal pleasure. Are those the reasons you'd say you're often tempted or would you say you have other reasons? Now, let's consider what the Bible has to say about why it is that we're tempted. It's clear in putting forth the reason. One is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. So let's unpack that. The Greek word translated tempted has the meaning to be tested, to ascertain the quality of, to prove. The Greek word translated desire has the meaning of craving for what is forbidden. The Greek word translated lured has the meaning to be drawn away, to be seduced. And the Greek word translated enticed has the meaning to be beguiled, to be deceived, to be deluded, to be baited, to be entrapped. So when we're tempted, it's a form of testing, ascertaining the quality of proving our faith or our lack of faith. And that which is tempting to us comes from our own selfish desires and has to do with our craving what's forbidden to us by God. Now, we may be tempted to say that we don't think God has the right to forbid us anything. We want to do whatever we want to do and God doesn't have anything to say about it. If God is just a kind of cosmic party pooper, uh, then we may decide that we'll just pretty much ignore God. (laughs) Except, of course, when we reap the hurt and harm that comes from our doing what is forbidden. Then we very much want God to be involved in rescuing us from the consequences of our sin and selfishness. But what if God is not a cosmic party pooper? What if instead we were to realize from the start that when God forbids things to us, it's to protect us from the hurt and harm that eventually will result from our sin and selfishness. God wants us to celebrate and enjoy the good things of life, those things that are consistent with God's goodwill for us. But God forbids those things that are in reality bad for us, even if we refuse to recognize that. Well, why are they bad for us? James 1 continues, Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. It's important to be clear that temptation in and of itself is not sin. It is a form of testing. When our desires are selfish and are not consistent with God's goodwill that blesses us, our selfish desires give birth to sin that leads to spiritual death, to separation from God, and ultimately to physical death. It's also important to be clear that all of our desires are not selfish. God gave us good and healthy desires also that lead to happiness and to fulfillment. It's our selfish desires that lure us away from God, that draw us away from God, that seduce us away from God. They disrupt our relationship with God and they damage our relationships with other people because that's what being seduced by selfishness inevitably does. Now, we may not want to believe this, but we're, when we're enticed 
by our selfish desires. That's how we become beguiled, deceived, deluded, baited, entrapped. Now, I I know, I, I know, all this talk about temptation and selfishness and sin can seem like a real downer. We'd rather not think about it. We'd rather avoid admitting any of this stuff. And we definitely do not want to own up to it. So, what takes place? We're tempted to deceive ourselves by rationalizing. We engage in rationalizing when we say things like, how can something that feels so right be wrong? God wants me to be happy, and what I'm doing makes me happy, so it can't be wrong. I'm the exception to the rule. I don't think anything hurtful will happen to me in my case. The people who do not approve of what I'm doing are just being judgmental. They are worse than I am. Compared to them, I'm a saint. My marriage was never the perfect will of God. He, she is my true soulmate. He, she makes me feel alive makes me feel the most me. Again and again, we can try and rationalize and give in to temptation, which gives birth to sin. But, if we do not recognize our sin and selfishness and separation from God, we will not recognize our need for a Savior. So, what are we to do when we're tempted to rationalize our temptations and to give in to sin. We need to embrace the wisdom of God. Do not start down the road of the wicked. The first step is easy, but it leads to heartache and do not go along the way of evildoers. Stay away from it. Don't even go past it. And if you find yourself anywhere near it, Turn your back and run as far as you can in the opposite direction. The issue is not, are we going to be tempted? Are we going to be tested? We are. The issue is, are we or are we not going to give in to temptation? And if we do, are we going to blame others or not? Back as far as the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve got caught up in the blame game when it came to temptation. And how many people today play the blame game when they give in to temptation? They say things like, if my employer had paid me what I was worth, I wouldn't be so lazy and loaf so much at work. If my teacher hadn't been so unreasonable in the questions asked on tests, I wouldn't have cheated. If my parents hadn't been so strict, I wouldn't have gotten pregnant. If my wife would have met my needs, I wouldn't have had the affair. If my husband would have loved me the way he was supposed to, I wouldn't have cheated on him. Rationalization after rationalization. Excuse after excuse. The band sang in the Taylor Swift song, It was a moment of weakness, and you said yes, you should have said no. When tempted to do things that damage our relationships with God or with others, we need to say no, and not to rationalize it, or to blame it on what we call a moment of weakness. We're responsible for the choices we make, even if those choices are foolish and self-destructive. Harry Randall Truman was the 83-year-old owner of the Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake in May of 1980. For the two months prior, to the final eruption of Mount St. Helens, the most deadly and destructive in American history. Earthquakes and volcanic activity had warned 
of impending disaster. Truman was urged to leave, but he was not about to do it just because some scientists said he was in danger. Truman told the reporters, I don't believe it. What was the result? Truman and his lodge were buried beneath 150 feet of mud and debris from the volcanic eruption. His body was never found. We may not want to believe the danger that giving into temptation places us in or the destructive results that may ensue. But that does not mean they're not true. It is foolish to ignore the dangers of temptation and think that we will somehow be exempt from the consequences. When it comes to temptation, we'd be wise to be like the father in the video who said that he didn't even trust himself when it came to temptation. And that applies to the temptation to use social media on our phones in harmful ways as well as to engaging in destructive behaviors in person. So I want to ask you a question. Would you ask yourself, what comes from giving in to temptation? Really, what have you experienced that's genuinely good and healthy from times when you said yes to temptation? Isn't it true? That saying yes to temptation again and again results in things that are bad and unhealthy. Like the disintegration of trust between you and your spouse. Or you and your parents. Or you and your kids. Or you and your co-workers. How many times has saying yes to temptation, even if it was kept secret for a while, eventually negatively affected people's physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health. Now friends, here's the reality. Again and again and again. Temptation leads to loss. The loss of joy. The loss of freedom. The loss of friendships. The loss of integrity. The loss of jobs, the loss of a marriage, the loss of self-respect, the loss of respect by others. God does not want us to experience the pain and grief that comes with loss after giving in to temptation. That's why the Bible warns us against giving in to temptation. You see, how we respond to temptation goes to the heart of who we really are. The root of all temptations is to establish our identity in something other than in Christ. When our identity is in something other than in Christ, deep down, we never feel good enough about who we are. We feel inadequate. We feel like something's missing. We become deceived through temptation into believing that doing what God says is not good or healthy for us will fill the emptiness within us, will make us feel valued, will make us feel good enough, will bring us pleasure that will make the feeling of inadequacy we struggle with just go away. But it's not true. So if you buy that, if you're willing to accept that giving in to temptations really will not meet the deepest needs of your heart and your soul, what are you to do? Turn to Jesus. It's that simple and complex. It's that easy and that hard. Jesus understands our temptation because He Himself was tempted. He struggled with it. He suffered because of it, but He overcame it, and He can help us overcome it. Hebrews 2.18, because He Himself suffered when He was tempted, 
He is able to help those who are being tempted. If you don't get that patterning your life after Jesus, aligning your will with the will of Jesus, is what you need to resist self-defeating, relationship-wrecking temptation, you're going to continue down the road of heartache and loss. So what do you need to do? When you experience temptation, at least be honest enough to admit it. Write down specifically what temptation that you're struggling with. And every day, pray at least two minutes that at least for that day, you will not give in to that temptation. And if you still can't seem to shake the temptation, share your sense of temptation with one person whom you trust and who is godly and spiritually mature and ask them, To hold you accountable. Here's the bottom line. You are going to be tempted. That's a given. How you handle temptation is not a given. It is your choice. So, what's it going to be? Let's pray together. God, in those times when we're really honest with ourselves... We're able to acknowledge and to admit that temptation comes our way time after time after time. We live in a sinful, corrupt world. And we so easily can be tempted to give in to selfishness and doing those things that bring us, we think, pleasure, no matter how it may bring hurt or harm to other people. And God, you set these guardrails, these boundaries for us so that we don't give in to temptation and bring damage to ourselves and to our relationships. But so often we just blow through those guardrails. God, I'm praying there will be a moving of the Holy Spirit that would convict us, that we would be able to sense when we are being led astray, and we would find strength in Christ, in whom we find our identity, to say no to those things that are wrong, bad, hurtful, harmful and you have said don't go there because it's not best for us and because you love us it's the evil one who wants us to get off the road and when we do lord a time and again we can end up crashing and burning and for those of us god who've already given into temptation and embraced sin may we pray for your forgiveness may we experience a cleansing of all shame and guilt. And may we realize, God, you offer us a second chance, a fresh start, a new beginning. God, help us to choose wisely, to choose the way of love, to choose to live in the way of Jesus every time. We pray this through Christ. Amen. We are so very pleased that you worshiped with us at Journey Church Online today. Our hope is that you had this sense of God speaking to you, encouraging you, challenging you, so that you might live the very best life possible in and through Jesus Christ. I invite you, if you would, to go to journeyconnection.com and to complete the eConnect card there. Please let us know of any questions you have any ways that we might encourage you, any way that we might pray for you. Or if you're at the point where you know, yes, I'd like to start a relationship with Christ, please let us know that on the eConnect card and and we'll dialogue back and forth with you of how you can take the first step of trusting your life to Jesus, finding your identity in Christ, and it'll give you a brand new start in living. We would love to have that opportunity. Or if in some way you'd like to connect with one of our journey groups online or in person, so you can experience authentic, real Christian community, please let us know of that. One other thing. We have the opportunity, the privilege to serve Jesus. We do that in person and through our online ministry. And those of you who love Christ and love Journey Church have the opportunity and the privilege to give financially, to make all this possible. So I'd encourage you to go to journeyconnection.com, click on the giving tab, 
and to begin to think about how can you give in a way that makes a real difference, that blesses the lives of people, that helps people who are struggling with temptations to find a new beginning in life. So I would encourage you to do that. Please know that when you give financially, it not only makes a difference in the life of Journey Church, but in our community partners as well. One of them is called the Society of St. Andrew. And we contribute financially to them. And they glean food. They take food that would otherwise perish. And they feed thousands and thousands of people. You make that possible through your giving. So thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. We pray God's blessing to be with you. And I hope you'll be with us next Sunday again as we talk about Let's Get Real. <music>